Yeah, yes, of course, of course. Yeah. After you, I mean, you, after that, the said that the same. Okay. Yeah. At, 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 okay. at the end of the same. Let me start. Let me start by thanking you, uh, Maria Rosaria, Giacomo, and the other colleagues. Uh, and actually to congratulate you for an excellent uh, series Thank with you. Stella Cast. I think that your students are very lucky. I don't know many universities that have put together such an impressive uh, program. And, oh, and thank you so much, Costa. Yeah, last September I was in uh, beautiful uh, Perugia for the Critical Air Conference, but today, unfortunately, I appear to you as a shadow on the screen, a voice without a body, <laughs> uh, talking of literature, like a ghost. It's a ghostly <laughs> present. You are in Perugia, in Roma, in other cities. I am in Athens. And of course, I think this ghostly presence is quite uh, symbolic of our ghostly times, times of illness, of mm. a permanent state of exception, of loss of many rights. And the physical distanciation we follow out of solidarity in order to keep others in society. Uh, sense positive, effective, we want to call it that. Uh, that, you know, we can meet online, that people know now how to meet online, and we're brought together from different parts of the world. So what I want to talk about today is law and the humanities. The first part, we look at the what the humanities are, what is the meaning of humanities. The second, at the, I have a quick look at the key schools in law and humanities uh, scholarship. And then the third, I will indicate an alternative, a critical approach to the field of humanities, which I, I, I hope will also go together with what you heard earlier from uh, the other participants, uh, in particular from Duncan Kennedy and uh, Michelle and, and Hugo Matei. So I first realized that there is something strange about the term uh, humanities. At a first meeting to set up a European consortium of humanity centers, Except for the center I represented, the Backbeck Institute for the Humanities that we set up back in 2003 and was the first in Britain, I think all the other members of this consortium came from single disciplines, archaeology, English, history, media, philosophy, and the like. And then I, I realized that there's no proper or widely used words that translates the humanities either in Greek or in Italian, yeah. which seems to be their mother tongues, their mother languages. This, in other words, that the, the humanities, what we call the humanities, while the nostalgic look to the South and the East and the past, are a definitely modern and quite clearly American invention. There are no faculties, uh, there were no faculties, courses, or centers for the humanities in European universities until very uh, recently. So that's a very interesting, uh, that was an interesting thing to notice. And then I started looking for what the humanities are, and that mainly took, uh, took me to Amer the American uh, literature, uh, the humanities uh, literature. And according to the debate, to a very flourishing American debate, the humanities are uh, defined in two ways. Either as a set of academic subjects, typically classics, uh, philosophy, history, and literature, let's call it the disciplinary approach, or uh, the, the second approach is the humanistic approach, and it is an attitude towards teaching and learning which could be extended to all types of academic subjects, including the law. In the first approach, the disciplinary approach, the classics had initially the central position. And let me give you a taste from articles uh, about this question, mainly American articles in the 20th century. When I do this silly thing, I mean that I'm quoting 
and I can give you the references later. So, as late as 1918, the word humanities and the phrase Greek and Latin used as synonyms. In 1946, another article reports that in Scotland, a professor of Latin is called the professor of humanity, which is a, I think, correct or right designation because humanities is a Latin word and there's no obvious Greek word, a Greek equivalent. The 1934 edition, edition of Webster's dictionary regarded as primarily, uh, uh, defines the humanity as the branches of polite learning that are primarily conducive to culture, especially the ancient classics and belles lettres. But as the sciences grew in importance and the interest in classics started taking the backseat, the definition became more negative. So humanities are whatever science is indeed in a rather uh, interesting, funny uh, quotation. A professor of English in the 1960s uh, wrote that the once mighty humanities have now a reduced kingdom, a musty place filled with tombs, monuments, libraries, and talkative old guides who stroll around with their hands in their pockets, wearing glasses like me, and out of touch with reality, conducting you for a small fee to the graves of Beethoven, Shakespeare, and Sophocles. <laughs> so that was the key idea of humanities, look to the past, look to the greats. At the other end, the humanistic end, the humanities are presented as a defense against the soulless onslaught of scientific mentality. They emphasize the humanistic tradition and extend to embrace whatever influences uh, uh, or conduces to freedom or to this, or they study the sum total of man's, of man's activities. They chart greatness, monumental scale, fineness of activity, artistic activity, and the insight and deep insight examining the nature of human experience. Now, whatever tradition you choose, the humanities emerge not as a product of classical and Renaissance humanists, but of academic, pedagogic, and educational needs. And they are linked with what the American liberal arts colleges call bucket courses, from Plato to Nato, from Plato all the way to contemporary literature, Don DeLillo. And these bucket courses are the backbone of American liberal arts education. So it is against this background that we must examine the recent literature in law and literature, and of course now the law and the humanities. There are already many books, journals, and conferences in this emerging field of legal scholarship. They include, I think, the best of the journals is uh, Law, Culture, and the Humanities. In Italy, there is a Rivista Pol Polemos, and of course, Law and Critique, which is the Journal of uh, Critical Legal Studies, was the place where it all started back in the 90, uh, 1980s in Britain. Now, let me tell you a story. My first uh, published article in 1984 was initially rejected by the Journal of Law and Society because it included at least 10 words that could not be found in the Oxford English uh, Dictionary. Today, any article that wants to show some sophistication and knowledge of philosophy must include words like deconstruction, jouissance, and logocentrism, which were the words that led to the initial rejection of my article. So how did that happen? How did we move from one to the other? And what is the link between the two disciplines, law and the humanities, which they look initially extremely different. Okay, in 1943, uh, Roscoe Pound, perhaps the greatest American legal theorist, wrote a remarkable article entitled 
the humanities in an absolutist world. Brown, in 1943, yeah, is scathing about the emerging new era of materialism and consumerism, of unmanageable bigness in government, in obsession with power, security, and grandiose schemes of world organization. Indeed, if we add a couple of items like coronavirus, Salvini, and Trump, we could have a full list of the evils of our contemporary world next to the evils that Pound introduces. Now, Pound draws a sharp line between the sciences and the humanities. But unlike the standard humanistic position, Pound explains that the humanities are dispensable, they can be get rid of for political and ideological reasons. He writes, men are to be trained in the physical and natural sciences so as to promote material production. They are to be trained in the natural sciences so as to promote passive obedience. Very strong words. For that to happen, he adds sarcastically, the past is to be cancelled. We are to begin with a clean slate. Our accumulated control of external nature has gone so far that there remains only the task of making it available for universal human satisfaction. The causes of envy and strife are to go, are to be abandoned alongside want and fear. Mankind will settle down to a passive enjoyment of the material goods and will neither require nor desire anything more. For him, the role of the humanities, therefore, is to resist a certain type of autocratic government, which bases in its power on the manipulation of desire. Citizen enjoyment can be achieved only in this idea after the blind satisfaction of material wants has been raised into the goal of individual and state. And it is accompanied by a government that promotes political apathy. Now, we're 80 years later. Has this cry of despair and pessimism by Roscoe Pound come, uh, come true? Is it true? Can the humanities play the role he assigned to them in 1943? Is it possible today to remain true to what uh, Roscoe Pound called a humanist F regime. Now, to answer that, I will examine two recent important answers to the, to the role of uh, law in the humanities by Martha Nussbaum and, secondly, Jack Bolkin and Stanford Levinson, two extremely well-known American law professions from Yale and, uh, and Texas. Nussbaum, of course, is a classicist, a historian of ideas, who turned a law professor. And perhaps you know that Stanley Fish, one of the best professors of literature in America, became a law professor and uh, went to Duke University in order, as he put it, to become the best paid professor in the American Academy, because of course law pays more than, <laughs> than English and literature. So anyway, um, what uh, Nussbaum, uh, Nussbaum uh, argues in her book called Cultivating Humanity in Legal Education, what she argues is that the humanities have to address the problems of how to live with dignity as a rational animal, in a world of events that we do not fully control. Issues of vulnerability and need, of terror and cruelty, also of pleasure and vision, are what the humanities can teach us about. This huge agenda can be delivered through three values. Socratic self-examination, world citizenship, cosmopolitanism, I mean, and is extremely uh, keen and central in uh, propounding, promoting uh, cosmopolitanism, 
And finally, through the narrative imagination, Socratic self-examination, well, the narrative imagination. This is what the humanities can teach us. And when she turns to legal education, Nussbaum says that it is a form of a specialized professional training and not the best preparation for citizenship and, city and civilized life. The values and goals of humanity, she claims, are not germane to legal education. Lawyers are allowed to win, not to fight for truth and justice. In this sense, they're closer to the sophists rather than to Socrates. Yet, historically, the relationship between law and what we call the humanities has been intense and intimate. All great philosophers from Plato to Hobbes to Kant, Hegel, Marx, Weber, Foucault, Derrida, Bobbio, whoever you want to mention, all had a very political I can barely hear you. Really, you can't hear me. No. Can you, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the uh, so connection is not that good. It seems the connection is not that good. Let me change my server. Yeah. For okay. A, yeah, for a minute, I'll change <laughs> my server. Okay. Okay. So I can advantage of these uh, to to introduce you properly. Uh, I'm honored and pleased to uh, to welcome Professor Duzinas, uh, who is uh, giving a, a wonderful lecture to us. We are very lucky, as he said. And uh, as Professor Duzinas is a professor of law at Birbeck in London, and he is one of the found of the founder of, of the, the, the law school at Birbeck University of London. And he's also a prominent figure in, in, the, political, in the political scene in, in Greece. So thank you very much for, for being with us, Costas. I'm really grateful. I really feel really happy and honored to have you with us today. And so, and let's hope that the, the connection is better now. Is it better? It seems it is. So, may, okay, so oh, you you may you may switch off the the webcam. Boy, well, you cannot see me. Uh, yeah. So uh, let, let's I, let's try let's try it this way. Okay. Uh, ha, ha, shall I turn the camera off? And uh, I'll turn the camera off, yeah? Okay. Okay. Is Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let, let me finish with Nussbaum. So she turns to legal education. She has explained the humanities and what the humanities can do. Turns to legal education and says that lawyers are more like sophists rather than Socrates. They're allowed to win uh, cases not to fight for. Uh, but as I said, the relationship between uh, law and philosophy and uh, theology uh, and theory is long and intimate. Um, before the creation of the various disciplines, when thinkers wanted to contemplate the organization of their society, the they look at law, ethics, Hegel's philosophy of right, the, or uh, Kant's uh, second uh, uh, second uh, critique. These are all attempts to examine the legal aspects of the social bond and to discover a type of legality that attaches body and soul and keeps them together 
and links them to the demands of society. Now, for Nussbaum, these are matters of diversion. These are adornments. These are peripheral uh, in legal education. Lawyers are sophists, they are rhetoricians, they are litigators, people driven by profit. They try to persuade audiences at any cost rather than for the search of, uh, for truth. Therefore, the solutions he proposes for a humanistic legal education are rather anodyne. There are three. Law courses need to teach ethical reasoning, uh, practical moral philosophy. Second, they should have essay writing rather than written examinations. And finally, they should have courses in international and comparative law, which encourage a more global understanding of the world. Courses on law and the humanities end up in this way, entertaining and lightening the heavy load of law studies. They give them a useful cultural gloss. A few references to Sophocles, to Dante, to Shakespeare, to Melville and Kafka, Kafka can impress the professional cocktail party. And of course, they disprove the widespread view that lawyers are boring and philistines. Now, I'm afraid that this kind of liberal uh, humanism light, decaffeinated humanism, uh, can contribute to the predicament that uh, Martha Nussbaum acknowledges and regrets. The cosmopolitan self, the ethnic community that she envisages, is too closely modeled on the values of American liberal individualism. And as we know, this kind of liberalism is often accompanied by high attitude uh, bombers, a racism that does not speak its name, and an institutional structure that if we came across in an African state, we call it a failed state. What we're watching today and yesterday, the last two or three days in the American elections, it's quite unbelievable for us here in Europe, in Italy, in Britain, or in Greece. You know, the fact that there is, a, or there was, an attempt, a pretty well-organized attempt, to stop people from voting. The fact that the Supreme Court may decide with a composition that changed at the very last moment whether Trump wins the election. Uh, the fact that the whole democratic process, which is supposed to be the center of a liberal institutional structure, at this point is being challenged. In the terms that Roscoe Pound used, the barbarians are not just at the gate, they have entered the city and the guards have abandoned the fight. Now, if Nussbaum offers a rather tepid uh, defense of the humanities. The, uh, the text by Jack Balkin from Yale University and Levinson from Texas University, Law in the Humanities, an uneasy relationship, abandons fully the values of Pound. Lawyers and legal academics for Balkin are fighters out to win battles with different audiences. Other disciplines are useful to lawyers only as aids to victory. Interdisciplinary studies of economics or psychology, occasionally of sociology, are useful to the extent that they give arguments by a results-oriented legal education and legal practice. The humanities, on the other hand, are secondary because reading literature does not have any useful effect. The only useful knowledge the humanities can offer is the study of rhetoric, because it improves the forensic skills of lawyers and litigators. The job of the lawyer is following the bon mot of Oliver Wendell Holmes, is to help his fellow citizens go to hell, if that is what they want. 
commenting on the infamous torture memoranda of the uh, Justice Department written by elite lawyers. These were memoranda that were asked by the Defense Department from the Justice Department as to whether American investigators had the right uh, entitled to uh, torture uh, people that had been uh, had been arrested in, in Iraq in the aftermath of the war. So in this uh, this memoranda actually supported uh, various types of uh, torture and Balkin claims in this article that acquaintance with Homer and Shakespeare would not have changed what ambitious young lawyers wrote in order to please those in power. Even a torture can love a sonnet. So let me finish this part. Three ways of linking law and the humanities have emerged from this discussion. First, Roscoe Pound. The humanities can help resist the onslaught, the attack of materialism, of consumerism, of a non-powerful state. Martha Nussbaum, second. They have a very limited role in cultivating the moral and rational abilities of law students. Finally, Balkin, they have no major role to play because they cannot help lawyers win arguments nor do they prepare law students for the battles ahead. So let me come to the third and final part with a slightly different approach. It seems to me that all three uh, of these approaches, of these attitudes, of these versions of the law and humanity link are very limited. Even if we look historically, even a limited examination, as I said earlier, of the link between the two would have given a very different result. Philosophy, poetry, and law are the oldest forms of Western education. The Greeks, lacking a clerical case and holy books, learned about their past and their society from a poet, Homer. In Italy, after the Christianization of uh, Europe with the empire, theology assumed the mantle of philosophy, and it was taught uh, with law to students versed in the artes liberales, mainly the trivium, grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, which formed the backbone of the medieval university. Bologna, the first European uh, university, was established in the 12th century as a law school that developed out of theology and philosophy which were flourishing there. By the 13th century, up to 10,000 students from all over Europe studied in Bologna, and after graduating, they went to work both for church and the state, using their legal expertise to protect secular leaders from ecclesiastical incursions. Once, therefore, we take this long durée approach to law and the humanities, the privileged terrain of this field is no longer the law classroom, the American, in particular, law classroom, or representations of law. The humanities like law are not just cognitive strategies, strategies of interpretation, but they have an anthropological function. They bring together the symbolic and the imaginary to work on their common target. They have a common target, and the common target is the human, human nature, humanity, humanism. This is a family of concepts, institutions, and material practices which combine the exploration of meaning, of value, of tradition, with the age-old effort to regulate and control the social bond, to discipline social, soul and body, and to pacify social conflict. Now, humanism, for humanism, the humanities mean the sum total of man's activities, 
nothing that touches man is alien to the humanities, which have as a role to humanize. This is the Terentius old uh, saying. As uh, the poet Shelley put it, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Now, lost job, strictly speaking, is more limited, is more parochial, more uh, linked to uh, jurisdictions and places. And yet, over the last 30 or 40 years, law has acquired a universalizing tendency and to that extent has joined the humanities in this task of constructing the human. Human rights in particular have joined this global civilizing mission They share the process and regulate most every aspect of humanity. The concept of humanity is an invention of modernity. Athens and Rome had citizens, not men, in the sense of members of the human species. Free men were Athenians or Romans. They were Greek or barbarians, but not human. The term humanity appeared in the Roman Republic and meant eruditio et institutio in born artists. Humanities, humanitas, the term humanitas was used to distinguish between the homo human, the educated Roman, and the homo bad who, uh, for Cicero, only who conform to certain standards are really men in the full sense and fully merit the epithet human and the attribute humanitas. Humanity started life not as something shared, but as an acquired taste, the outcome of education, of edification, of discipline and erudition, as a strategy of distinguish between the civil the example of real humanity and the uneducated, uncivilized be being who do not have uh, aesthetic discrimination and judgment. Now, of course, modern humanism, with Christian universalism at its center, claims to cover now all men and examine the total of man's activities. cognitive strategies associated with the Latinate humanitas, humanities, and the Greek anthropos, anthropology. The humanity of the humanities represents both the subject and the object. We have the self-reflecting knower, the process of knowing, and what becomes known. And all three refer to the same subject, the Western man. Humanities, literature, history, uh, uh, art, they all look at Western man. But the anthropology, social and physical anthropology, looks at the anthropos, who is just an object of cognition. It does not study the human species, but the diverse non-Western peoples, societies and cultures that emerge through travel, conquest and colonization. Humanity is civilization. Anthropos is outside or before civilization. So let me now finish by looking at legal humanity and legal humanity. I'll start with a story. In April 1872, a letter entitled Are Women Animals? and signed by an earnest English woman, uh, that was a pseudonym, of course, appeared in the Times of London. It read the letter. Whether women are the equals of men has been endlessly debated. There is no answer to it. But can it be too much to ask for a definite acknowledgement that at least women are animals? Allow me through your columns in the Times, to appeal to a 
650 deputies, uh, members of parliament, and ask, is there not one among you then who will introduce such a motion that animals, the word animals, that animals include women? There would then be at least an equal prohibition on authority to cut dog or woman. Now, this is 1872. It is a period that in English legal history is known as the period of the persons uh, cases. The persons cases were legal cases in which when the term person appeared in a statute, in an act of parliament, particularly acts of parliament dealing with political rights, the courts had interpreted uh, the word person not to include uh, men. Now, at the same time, there were lots of laws that stopped any cruelty, prohibited cruelty against dogs, horses, cattle, and so on, while there was something in relation to women who were the chattel, the property of their fathers, their husbands. And this is a, a period that lasted until 1929 when the, the House of Lords, the Privy Council, said that the word persons included women as well. If we now move to today, to contemporary London, from 1872 to 2020, in London, as in Roma, as in Athens, we have an underground humanity of immigrants and failed asylum seekers without papers, the Saint Papier, the famous Saint Papier, which survives in our city without shelter, without food, without rights. In London alone, it is estimated that half a million people live this kind of life. So in a recent documentary about immigrants, uh, Jami, who is an Ethiopian and sleeps rough in parks, addresses people like us from our comfortable homes, keeps proclaiming, says Jami, Human rights, human rights. What is the difference between me and you, the people with papers? You are humans like me, people like me. We have two hands, two eyes, two legs. What is the difference between me and you? Human rights, human rights. But where are the human rights for the asylum seekers? Now, the earnest English woman for a previous period, Germany today, state an indisputable truth. They all be human, humanity has always excluded, despised, and degraded parts of it. Humanity is not used as a strategy for separating people into full less human and inhuman. If we examine the key moments of emergence of a legal humanity, we have first the great 18th century declarations in France in the United States, which pronounced the natural rights of man as inalienable because they were independent of governments, temporal factors, and so on. And yet this universal man had the characteristics of the national citizen. The modern subject reaches his humanity it was his, only his, by acquiring political rights of citizenship while exclu excluding others. The alien does not have rights because he's not part of the state. And he's a lesser human being because he is not a citizen. This is Jami's cry. One is a man to a greater lesser degree because one is a citizen to a greater, a greater or lesser degree. But there is a second exclusion as the earnest lady reminds us. Mankind also excludes improper men, that is, initial women and men in property, or property, humans without racial, ethnic, or sexual, uh, or sexual uh, dominant uh, attitudes, but minorities. The immigrants, the refugees, the unemployed, the one use humans, as they're called, they are not fully human. They don't have the right to have rights, the minimum legal recognition of rights. So finishing, I would say that the history 
of the 20th century has taught us that there is nothing sacred about any definition of humanity and nothing eternal about the scope, about how many people uh, does uh, humanity include. Therefore, we have a pressing moral and political uh, task to develop a humanity of resistance what, uh, and a law of resistance, what uh, Roscoe Pound called uh, as uh, the humanities of resistance. Because the stakes are no longer or exclusively the development of delicacy of discernment, of the sharpening of a hermeneutical attitude, or even of moral edification. The uh, idea of a, a humanities of resistance is a critique of those dominant practices which divide and uh, dominate. And the duty to resist here is ontological. It is about how we create uh, of the 21st century. Uh, it rises from the constitution of the self of each one of us through the ethical call of the other, of the singular other. Inadequacy, the gap and serve. And uh, so by concluding, I say that law and the human, human are central contributors, central actors to the project of constructing the human. But the only universal human is, to use the Greek term, the anthropos, a divert, different, unique and plural humanity. And of course, those excluded from humanity. And humanities of resistance places the university, both law and the humanities, in opposition to many and great powers, which include the nation, the state, its sovereignty, and those media, ideological, religious, and cultural forces that stop and prevent this kind of humanities of resistance. In this project, philosophy, aesthetics, and law will become, again, linked in the way they were throughout the in our part of the world, here in the Mediterranean, in Italy, in Greece, in Spain, and will stop being a vocational study of how to win cases and of how to create a very sharp sense of discernment and aesthetic uh, and, and, and aesthetic edification. That was all. Thank you very much. I hope that you heard me at least. You didn't see me. I'll put the camera now on and uh, we can have a discussion if you wish. So, so thank you. I cannot see you yet. So thank you so much for us. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't want to, to theorize uh, your your complex uh, argumentations. But I would say that at least it is a claim for non-self-referentiality in law, and also uh, it seems like uh, I, I, this is not a, a yeah. This is a question. Uh, although we have comments from from Professor Constantini right now. And uh, my question uh, would be, uh, is it that you, you think there's a, a kind also of uh, lack of morality, of moral values in law right now? That So this is the reason why we need the humanities? Uh, I yes, I, I totally, yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I am with Roscoe Pound in this, uh, that, you know, there is the need for great emphasis on morality and on justice in legal study. Uh, I think that uh, positivism as the main, I think, background and method of uh, teaching the law has totally, in a sense, atrophied, has uh, taken out of law this classical idea that law is about justice, that you know, a, a law without justice is like a body without soul. But what I'm also saying is that this is not enough, that it is not enough, as Nussbaum says, to have some courses in moral philosophy 
and you know give some hypothetical cases about morality and so on. We need to become much more explicit in an attempt to both make the law meet its own internal preconditions of justice. You know, if, for example, refugee law gives to the some papier certain rights and the, our administrative authorities do not actually, and legal authorities do not actually uh, carry out, implement those rights, then of course, we as lawyers, as lawyers who understand the role of law and lawyers in the moral and just organization of society, we have to criticize them. But there is also a second just, a second kind of justice. The first I would call the internal justice. The second I would call an immanent justice. It is a justice which is both inside and outside the legal system. And it is a justice who acts, acts not just that the law carries out its own promises in terms of rights for refugees, for example, but that the law itself has to change in order precisely to create a situation in which all of us, particularly the excluded, can have a proper life. So this is not just a moral question. This is also a political question. So morality has to be introduced much more in the humanity a certain extent help in that direction, but it seems to me, and the difference between the article I sent you to read, which we published back in 2007 or 8, I think, and my position today is that in the last 13 years between 2007, 8 and 2020, we have understood much, much stronger, I think, the importance of political action within law and outside of law in order to improve the legal system itself, not just the way that we deliver law uh, from within its positive uh, archive, within the positive legal system. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, now uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Cristina Cosantini, who is a colleague in in Perugia, she teaches European private law and she produces uh, widely in law and literature. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm here. Uh, thank you for this kind invitation. I'm very pleased to be with you, with all of you, and to discuss what is a central part of my research path. So, having been involved in the interdisciplinary enterprise for at least 15 years, I have selected some ideas to be discussed in dialogue with the Costas Duzinas Illuminati introduction, and I'll try to propose briefly, roughly 20 minutes, uh, my own point of view, debating the several declensions considered in Professor Duzinas' chapter, and discourse, and namely the ontological, the genealogical, the aesthetic, and the textual dimensionality, specifically of law and literature jurisprudence. So I start from law and literature, and then I move uh, to law and humanities. So first of all, my first claim is to put under question the substantial consistency of the pairing and, which suspends us among different realms, or we could metaphorically say between diverse jurisdictions of knowledge. And to provoke immediately the reserve of sense kept into the pages of literary works, one could represent the path embedded in the copulative end with the visionary image evoked by Margaret in Forster's Howard's End. And the image is that of the Rainbow Bridge connecting together prose and passion, solidity and transparency, reality and imagination, surface and depth. Without it, according to Margaret's consciousness, we are mingless fragments, half monks, half beasts, unconnected arches that have never joined into man. Beyond the metaphor crossing the end, we are moving through an osmotic threshold and trespassing our figurative certainties. So to support our researching ads with a new, refounded and complete humanist sense. There is something in common between law and literature, something that is usually forgotten or not properly declared. Both of them are striated spaces of action and representation, stressed by the movable lines amidst the general and the particular, the abstract and the concrete, the predictable and the contingent, the seen and the unseen, the being and the might be. 
Both of them are dynamic fields of tensions and counter moves. Both of them are inescapably bound to their constitutive ambiguity. They are living in and of their immanent excess. Therefore, the in-between at the center of the encounter located in the end becomes the unexpected point of solution at to reconcile the ontic to the ontological, the beings to the being, the empirical and observable to the deeper and not perceptible structure of reality. At the crossroad of the rainbow bridge, the aesthetic perception of different shades of trespassing is complete. Facing with literary potentialities, law becomes in its own uncanniness liberational, redemptive. Now I'd like to plunge radically into the space of the end, and my discourse amounts to be a collection of notes from underground, so to inspect what is lurking across the waters under the bridge. This submersion is needed to answer to this question. Could law and literature really be considered and depicted as a cultural turn? And if so, from whence to where is the turn directed? Now I dissect three constitutive levels that compound the retrospective substantiality of the end encrypted into the in-between. And to name each of them, I am proposing a suggestive and synthetic label. The first, named reversive subversion, is the genealogical level, where the timing of the encounter is remeasured. The second, named loud mass, is the critical level, where the cultural strategies are disclosed. And the third, named Interesse Interstitium, is the epistemological level where the possible direction of the journey for the future is proposed. So the first level I name reversive subversion, and it is perfected link to what uh, Professor Duzinas has reminded us about the remaking of our Western past. First of all, we are inclined to emphasize the heterodox force that have been unleashed by the mutual meeting between law and literature only in recent times. This narrative must be retold. It is the product of a genealogical plot, and here I'm making use of the term genealogy in a precise meaning that is in Nietzschean in its inspiration. To denote the gap, the distance, that of course from the origin of an idea, of an intellectual construct, and the tradition of thought that have returned it over time. So genealogy is not intending to search the inviolable identity of the origin. On the contrary, it is devoted to inspect fractures and schisms, dispersals and deviations, fault lines and aberrations that locate the moment of arising in its immaculateness in a Derridian difference. In this perspective, the conventional account appears to be partial and declamatory being based on the proper concealment of the true origin. Despite the classical philosophical claim about language and veritative differentiality, antiquity has been nurtured by the structural connection between law and literature, and also between law and humanities in the sense declared by Professor Duzinas. They made a full of compound perfection. John Alford and Dennis Seniff's seminal work, Literature and Law in the, in the Middle Ages, collects an astonishing mass of references, bearing out this mutual and unavoidable influence. And so during medieval and Renaissance time, the lawmen were humanists in strict sense, and at the same time, literary culture was pervaded by the presence of the law. Medieval poetry abounds in references to legal documents, and in this respect, Emily Steiner has brilliantly coined the expression documentary poetics to underline how frequently medieval writers borrow the textual apparatuses of the law to explain the forms through which doctrine and authority can be disseminated and experienced. Therefore, the act of bringing together is subversive in regression, because it allows us to reappropriate the purity of the point of insurgence against its following betrayal. What is the sense of the subversion, if not a regression towards the origin, an anarchic act of resistance against the social construction of separate disciplines? The originality has to be measured with respect to contemporaneity, not to the past. The innovation is a coming back. In the origin, there is the final destination. In this rediscover meaning, we can assert the political momentum embedded in law and literature project. It is a disobedient act, a concrete way of fighting against the power structure through which decisions of inclusion and exclusion are made. It encourages intransigent counteraction against conformity and normalization. 
Now I pass to the second level, that is the critical level that I name loud mass. When and why the volume on the interconnectedness has been cranked up? Was this loudness an aesthetic choice, a representation of maximalism, or there was a something more? To answer, we have to recross once again the space of the bridge to detect how one of the two banks has been essential to begin the traverse and to transform the proper morphology of the other side. In this regard, we have to critically reassess the strategies involved under the birth of the critical legal studies in US between 70s and 80s, from whence a particular intonation of the dialogue between law and literature derived. Critical legal studies were located precisely at the conjunction between the claim for a logical deconstruction and the political critique of American law. How was it possible and what was responsible for this permutation of conventional assets? It was for merit and fault, depending on the point of view of literature. François Cousset has cleverly explained how literary studies played a central role in importing French philosophy in the US cultural landscape. French theory, a mixture of Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, Lyotard, entered the United States through the literature departments. The writings of the French philosophers were read and analyzed from the perspective of literary studies and sifted through the literary filter. It was a second work of decontextualization and reappraisal that ultimately converted thoughts and styles. A potent ecological struggle between the secluded fields of knowledge in the American university was engaged, at the end of which literature would emerge victorious. Cousset synthetically sets out the weapons and the tactics used to win, a narrative relativism that made it possible to re-read the discourses of all the disciplines of philosophy, sociology, history, as so many narratives embedded in a yet vaster narrative structure. The use of such a perspective is a way to reshape the cartography of knowledge, the subversion of borders or the transformation of borders in topics of debate. Through a strategy of literarization, philosophy at first was made literary and lighted the fuse for an epistemic revolution. An unprecedented pan-narrative or pan-textualist obsession provoked the expansion of the category of literature, deprived of a fixed definition, to all the fields of human and social sciences. A centripetal movement produced an earthquake universe where the floods of literature began to run everywhere. The English department became a new Rome from which prodigious conquests were launched, crusade to evangelize distant territories. Even the texts and the words of the law underwent a disciplinary recentering that consisted in drawing them toward literary studies, prioritizing their analysis of text and casting their proposition as inherently literary. The connection we are depicting today in the form of a possible conjoint association was really preceded by a pandemic contagion. This was the historical enactment of a reverted turn. Literature fed law from inside of its body. And then the third level of my discourse addressed to explore the future possibility of an aesthetic epistemology is named Interesse or Interstitium. In this perspective, I claim that law and literature jurisprudence and the law and humanities jurisprudence could be central for a new subversion of the idea of law itself. It is not just to disclose how our literature depicts the law, even if this is clearly fascinating. And with this respect, I try to say that the law in literature declension could be reassessed in terms of an aesthetic ontology. In this perspective, literature goes from being a mere descriptive act to a medium of a presentification of the law. So a noble device that makes the law concretely entified. Law lives in and through literature, and literature is metamorphosed into a new body for the law's appearance, definitely into a new corpus juris. It is not just about inspecting the subjective styles used by lawmen to express their thoughts, opinions, arguments, and decisions. This being, however, a significant moment of understanding up to give a concrete and then flesh voice to the legal formants, which otherwise would remain paper voices deprived of their carnal tongue. 
It's not just about viewing the intertextual structure of legal traditions, their sedimenting nexuses of referrals, their vertical movement and their open transcendence, these being, however, pivotal in order to disclose and follow genealogically permutations and passages, wounds and sutures. It's the ontology of the threshold that is kept by the end to be under question, as well as its cognitive and epistemological usefulness. It is this space of transition and marginality, of transferring and transignification that comes to the fore in its proper phenomenological consistence. The ways we use to pass, to move through this osmotic and indeterminate zone becomes properly a concrete act of a subversion and transgression. The metissage takes place not in the construction of a new mutant discipline, but rather in the mapping of a middle space of encounter in which the vernacular of law and literature can intermingle in a kind of a central jurisprudence, wedded to providing a new consciousness from a new polyphonic sensibility. So the interest, the being in between, wins against the pretenses of the metaphysical being, the monad, the absolute. The disclosure of the threshold that the law and exhibits becomes paradigmatic and redirects the discourse about law itself. The interest unveils the interstitial nature of the law, the hunting relation between law and non-law as an heretical stance towards the orthodoxy and the decision of law, the final expression of the dissolution of dogmatics. No law is referring to the non-normative, to a diffuse and disparate definition of the worthiness of the legal according to discrete but all vital and constitutive points of view. Here it is consumed the redemptive paradox of a use of the law indifferent to the authority, the liberational stance of a creation of legal meaning free from jurisdictional violence and coercion. The threshold is a living membrane which through its breath through the replacement of inhalation and exhalation, includes and excludes, and again, includes what has been excluded and excludes what has already been included. It is the transformative limb that decomposes and recreates the fragmented body of the law. It is the constitutive shade that exceeds and decompasses the corpus juris. It is the formant of all the legal formants. Only in this way, in the perpetual agony of indistinction, we can stand before the law. Therefore, to conclude, provoking at the end, as well as the beginning of my discourse with Forsteria Margaret's word, if we as lawyers want to acquire new consciousness and promote an authentic method of critique, we have only to connect, to remain into the between. So finally, to conclude, we have to inhabit the threshold. And thank you. Thank you, Christina. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Now we have um, comments for for Professor Tusina's uh, and Professor Costantini questions. Giacomo. You want to say something? Hi. Yeah. Th thank you very much to to both um, Costas and Christina for the fantastic presentations. And um, I, I would like to connect the two uh, talks and um, ask both of you if you because uh, Costas um, um, started with with pound, and I think it would be uh, amazing. Uh, to ask him and also Christina, if it is possible to elaborate an, a genealogy uh, from pound to uh, our days to to the contemporary of uh, this um, a genealogy of resistance, uh, looking into uh, lawyers um, both in common law and civil law, um, working with um, humanities and able to um, using them as a tool of resistance. Thank you. Costas, could you hear? Yes, yes, no, of course I could hear, yes. Okay. yes. Um, and let uh, me say that, uh, you know, the, the 
talk by Professor Constantine Christina. Uh, was, uh, can you hear me? Pardon? I, okay, yeah. I can. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, the talk by Professor Constantini it was absolutely superb. I mean, I will need to read it and hopefully you can send it to me and I can also send to all of you a part of the work that I'm referring to today. But I was really impressed by we the you. Process, excuse me, uh, we cannot hear you so well. Okay, can Professor Constantini start and then hopefully my, uh, my, my own connection will go back again? Okay. Okay, <laughs> please. Okay, because uh, Christina, you want to answer? So Cosas can switch to the other connection. Yes. So I give an answer to Giacomo. Yes, yes. Yes. Um, yes, of course, it is possible to construct a genealogy, but um, it is difficult to connect uh, the very purpose of the resistance. And so in the past, in general, uh, we have a kind of a master dominant player with respect to the different fields of disciplines. So the disciplines are governing our thought. And then, for example, for many years, uh, the law is regulating the way in which, for example, literary is explored. And in the same manner, literary is regulating the way in which uh, the uh, legal discourse uh, has to be structured. So the purposes of the resistance uh, is to dominate once again in the fields of uh, discrete knowledges and in the fields of different disciplines. So the genealogy is possible, but there is a counter genealogy in order to make it to the extreme point of solution, the act of resistance, and so to disclose the borders as the object of the discussion, of the critical discussion. But of course, uh, uh, to put together all the authors that are debating about uh, the possible political momentum of law and is, of course, uh, a, a net of possibility, depending on the different ways in which the resistance is conceived and is discussed. Okay. I would say that uh, counter genealogy is a genealogy in a Foucaultian sense, no? Don't you think? Um, so uh, when I use uh, genealogy, as I have tried to explain, uh, I use genealogy as a kind of a distance, of a gap between uh, the moment of arising of a specific idea, of a specific concept, and the tradition of thought that have rendered it in the following times. So in this sense, there is to um, make a kind of a break in this tradition of thought. Exactly. Right. Well, so there is a, a kind yeah. of genealogy that is structured in a, in a precise <laughs> tradition of thought, and then we have to reread this genealogy as a counter genealogy. In this sense, I have used this. Thank right. you. Thank you. Kasata, are you ready with the? Can video? you hear? Me? Can yes. you hear? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I I I switched to, I switched the camera off again, so hopefully okay. you can hear. Me. Okay, first I wanted to thank very much uh, Professor Costantini, Christina, um, for an absolutely wonderful uh, presentation uh, that I learned quite a lot. And I think it is, uh, she, she insisted on the, on the difference, although you know, she was too polite to say that, the difference between a European, particularly a Southern European approach to these questions and the Americans. Because of course the Americans through literature departments introduced French philosophy, but I think it was quite um, striking for someone like me coming from a kind of, sort of European humanist tradition, how shallow, how superficial many times that kind of introduction uh, was, that it was not based on any deeper understanding of what you call the genealogy of uh, the field, 
And of course, talking about genealogy, uh, and I think uh, Christina was very clear in her talk on that. I mean, the difference between history or historiography and genealogy is precisely that history, particularly that kind of monumental history as Nietzsche uh, describes it, who introduced also the term genealogy in the sense we're using today, um, is a history of concepts, a history of ideas, a concept that takes uh, hold or you know gets introduced in Rome or Athens and so on, and then through a period of development, eventually matures in our own in our own age. While uh, genealogy is precisely, as you put it, a, a history of fractures, of differences, of forces of power, of different relations that, of course, always can change the root of a particular concept, a particular practice, a, a particular being in a different direction. It's a history that takes full account, for example, of, of luck, of contingency, of the possibilities, possibilities that were realized, possibilities were not realized. And in that sense, uh, when you know you are asking about a genealogy of resistance, we can have different types of genealogies because uh, a genealogy is always more linked to the specific and the concrete, uh, to different ways in which actors and historical figures, but also the ordinary people, those people, those people who are not involved in the grand his histories that we read in our in our, uh, in, in our uh, middle schools and so on, how they help change the way in which a particular, uh, a particular idea or particular practice moved. Now, uh, and it seems to me that uh, that kind of approach uh, liberates us from a kind of disciplinary straitjacket and I think you explained that very well, uh, Christina. A, a discipline creates a, a, a straitjacket which, on the one hand, creates very rich borders between the different disciplines, and on the other hand, tells you that if in any way you try to, uh, perhaps in that bridging uh, fashion, uh, you know, sort of move from one discipline to the other, or try to introduce aspects of the excluded, which is part of what has been excluded anyway, which is a, always an absent presence, then you are basically abandoning the integrity of what you're doing. And it seems to me that this is extremely, extremely important that law and literature, law and the humanities, in a almost programmatic way, tells you that you have to look to the past, but not as a continuous, consistent, progressive uh, line that starts in Athens or Rome and ends up, you know, sort of in the Harvard Law School. Uh, but secondly, that those uh, resources, those methods, those concepts, and those uh, abilities that we may uh, we may mobilize today are part of an ongoing struggle. That there is a struggle. That there is conflict. That there is a, a, an academic epistemological, uh, a, a, you know, sort of conflict, tension, and so on, and that this conflict, I argued earlier today, has also certain ontological or anthropological effects. That by doing what we're doing, we can change both legal education, uh, students, and future lawyers and judges, but also change the way in which we understand what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Kostas, also for this answer. Um, questions from, from the, the PhD students? Or from the audience at large? So, so I think that this 
This was, thank you very much, Kostas, for being with us. I uh, want to, uh, uh, first, I would like to, to highlight, to stress um, that this was the perfect conclusion to our series. So it was really great. Thank you so much. And, um, and I would like to, to stress um, that, uh, it, so I hope that in this, um, during this uh, series of seminars, we have, um, we uh, achieved an idea of, of the law in relations to other disciplines. Uh, and especially of the limits of legal positivism, um, exploring uh, the relationships with uh, um, anthropology that also uh, causes today uh, talked about with uh, history and um, in, in the way Mikhail talked about and uh, with um, economics, of course, but politics and uh, and humanities, at least. And and um, well, also to stress the link between uh, what um, Professor Dusinas uh, said today and Professor Kennedy last week, because uh, both of them um, approached law in a um, and in the in its relation with uh, with other disciplines, in a very critical way, um, highlighting the limits of of legal discourse, but also its potentiality. And and I think it is what we uh, we have to uh, to take into account every day in our in our work in our uh, in our research uh, project. Um, so, uh, Cosas, if you if you like, if you are not tired, if you if you are not bored, <laughs> you wanna tell us something on. <laughs> now you have uh, saved me, rescued me from uh, following the American election. So. <laughs> no, wait, why don't you, what are your uh, impressions about? You know, so the, uh, I don't know what's going on. I'm discussing with you and Christine about these matters. No, I mean, it, it is from what I've seen from your program. It, is an, it was an amazing uh, series of lectures. I, I would have loved to, uh, perhaps you can organize in the future, on a number of occasions, Duncan and Ty have discussed uh, the differences between the American critical legal studies and the British yeah. <laughs> critical legal studies, which is an ongoing uh, theme. Uh, and it would be really very, very interesting in uh, in discussing it, and you know, at some future um, get together, you know, sort of when with yeah. Christina, who uh, clearly I think understands the differences between between the two, because there are important differences. Um, yeah, there are. You know, I, the, the way I put it, just as a joke to finish, is that. You know, when the early critical legal studies uh, tried to show the kind of indeterminacy of the legal text, the openness of the legal text, the way that legal argumentation against the standard either positivistic or rights-based approach of people like Dworkin or Rawls and so on, uh, can always lead to a different result from the one uh, considered the right result and so on. So when they, 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 they showed that, I think, you know, sort of pretty brilliantly, uh, somehow they expected there was an assumption that the legitimacy of law would suffer, which is what they wanted politically, you know, coming out of the 60s, the countercultural movement, and so on. Now, for us, I think, a little more cynical Europeans, the attitude was that, yeah, of course, I mean, anyone can show at some point uh, that the Bible or Shakespeare or Dante or this text or that text can have a number of meanings, you know, so that, you know, you can always show the ways in which texts unpick themselves, self-deconstruct and so on. The problem is to 
try to show, to understand and show what is accepted. In other words, to re reverse the, the priority and the hierarchy and explain those uh, practices, material practices, and also historical traditions and so on, which allow the texts to appear as close, consistent, you know, with right meanings and, and so on. Uh, so that was a kind of, sort of discussion in the early days that uh, by showing that texts do not have a certain and clear meaning in that positivistic sense that uh, people like Duncan, but not just Duncan, did so brilliantly, you do not help to make the world better. You know, sort of you make probably for much more interesting uh, discussions and texts and much more interesting argumentation, but there has to be also a political element. And, and here I wanted perhaps to conclude by making a little more explicit something that I said very, uh, very fast in my discussion, the distinction between internal and immanent criticism. Internal and immanent criticism. And I said that internal criticism is something that perhaps all of us do, whether we're part of a critical legal approach or a standard uh, academic approach and so on. Most of the articles written, uh, dogmatic articles about doctrine, about legal doctrine, about uh, private law, about uh, constitutional law, most of the articles written by academics are critical in the sense that particularly in terms of case law, they take a line of development and they show that perhaps it should have gone some different way. That, you know, the judges did not write, uh, de decide fully correctly what they had to decide. This is what, you know, le legal academic writing is mostly about, particularly in common law jurisdictions, where we have to deal with uh, big cases and big argumentation and so on. And that is internal critique. That is critique, as I put it earlier, that you ask the law to perform its promise in terms of rights, as I said, for refugees or for the poor people, for students, or today in the state of exception, if we want to adapt the, to adopt the Gambanian argument, my position is slightly different. It's not that we live in a state of exception, but the law has become exceptional you know, in its normality, you know, for, for some time now. But anyway, that is the internal. The immanent critique finds the distinction, the contradiction, the paradox between the way that the law as a whole exists and the place of law in the wider social context. That the law, as part of the way in which a society controls and disciplines itself, plays an important role in making society hang together, but by doing that, it also emphasizes, promotes, helps, strengthens those parts of the wider socio-political system that lead to unjust results. Lead, for example, to this huge inequality that we all know how it has grown over the last few years uh, and how it shows itself in the pandemic now with the much, uh, the much larger percentage of people from poor, for poor um, groups or from ethnic minorities suffer from, from the disease. So once you put the law within that imminent critique, which is to place the legal system and the effects, the impact of law in the wider social context, then immanent critique is something which uses the law in order to first illuminate and then try to change that second type of contradiction, the contradiction between the legal system as it operates in particular area and the wider unjust way in which our socio-political system works. So we need both critiques. The internal critique, is trying to make the law honest to itself. The immanent critique is, a, and it is a, a transcendence in immanence, something that Christine, I think, referred to, a kind which is transcendent and transgressive, perhaps, 
but it is also found within the, the historical context in which we speak and which tries basically or helps through a legal, uh, a legal methodology, legal tool to change the wider social uh, position. And there, of course, the question also becomes political. And there, law and politics uh, find their full, as it were, you know, sort of combination, their full intertwining, their osmosis. Again, a term that uh, Christina used. So it, it seems to me that we as uh, legal educators, particularly legal educators that are on the critical side, whatever one, uh, uh, whatever one, uh, one gives as a definition of critique, are always involved and have to be involved in both of, both of these two things, mm -hmm. both in the descriptive and the prescriptive, both in the positive understanding of the law and the deconstruction of that positive understanding that literature and theory and philosophy can, can give us. And I think in this direction, the series of seminars you had are quite exemplary, I think. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I mean, you know, perhaps unique in legal education anywhere in the world, not just in, in Italy, uh, because they expose all of us to the different perspectives through which that kind of critical, calm political approach uh, can operate and has, has operated. It is a difficult task. Critical ideas do not get reproduced automatically in our societies. And therefore, we need people like you, uh, Maria, like you, Christina, uh, like all your other speakers, who actually put that kind of of idea, that kind of seed back into, uh, you know, its historical genealogical perspective. We need that and we will need it even more, particularly if from what we see in the United States at this point, unfortunately, this great uh, power, this great he hegemon of the world is going through an extremely difficult period and I'm not sure that it will survive in our imaginary construction of the great American dream. I think uh, the institutions of America are in great need of reform. They show their kind of, I, I think, decline, the decline of what we used to call the great American uh, institutions, the great American in intellect, the great American uh, academic world. Uh, you know, I'm really very sad, you know, sort of to uh, to see what is happening in America. Uh, we had Duncan last year here in Athens uh, who gave a talk uh, about the Trump phenomenon and the way that the law and lawyers you know, can answer to it. And I must say that um, uh, Duncan was really extremely pessimistic. You know, sort of he seems, you know, I, you know it seems that there is a certain sort of running out of steam in the critical field. And I think what we're doing, you know, is helping re replenish it, you know, re, re, you know, re breathe new life into it again. Mm. I, I would say, and this is also a uh, um, short question to, uh, for you. I think that Duncan is not that pessimistic, it is pessimistic in a way, but uh, the internal critique he promotes, he, he proposes, um, is also um, a way to empower uh, the interpreter um, because, yeah, because you can think or, or imagine that by um, uh, deconstructing or, or um, may, um, reveal uh, the, um, the contradiction within an interpretation, uh, then you can um, also propose a, a different interpretation, which can produce a different, uh, um, can produce different, uh, a, a different distributive uh, equilibrium. Uh, whereas um, by uh, exerting um, any what you 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 name um, an, an imminent critique. Um, uh, then you um, 
then of course this, this is uh you need a, a poli also a political mobilization yeah. you cannot do just as a, as a as a jurist by yeah. yourself i mean you need to, you need you need to to mo mobilize uh, a, a political uh, context so in in this uh, i think that uh, <laughs> the facts um show uh, show that so in the in the us context this mobilization is is a difficult at the general level um but um i agree that we need both internal and imminent critique at, at the uh, legal educational level because that's really important to uh, for for a correct for a fair education of our students yeah. and of all jurists in general uh, let me give you an example from my you mentioned my political activity. You know, I was elected a member of parliament in 2015 uh, for the first ever radical left government in Europe, I suppose, the, by the party called Syriza. And as a, as a lawyer, as a law professor, I was in charge of a quite extensive process of constitutional reform. So we started a process of uh, public consultation public meetings uh, in order to add an element of constituent power into the process of amendment uh, in which we were talking to people and asking them uh, in relation to a number of proposals we were making. And then eventually we submitted a, a large number of very important constitutional amendment proposals uh, back in 2018. And I was the person kind of, sort of promoting uh, this amendment in parliament. So, you know, we had to argue first in a special committee on the constitutional amendment and then in the plenary about these changes. Now, what I found in this exercise, which was you know, quite unique, I mean, you know, for a critical lawyer to be in a position of trying to change the constitution of a country, and I will write about it more extensively uh, in the future, what I found was that our constitutions, and I think the Italian constitution, which I have uh, read, is very similar to the Greek constitution. Perhaps the Italian is even more radical in a sense than the Greek constitution. Constitutions create certain institutional expectations, normative expectations. There are certain normative ideas that exist within the text. Whether they were there at the beginning, you don't know. But, you know, after the period, a decade of life of the constitution, they have become internally consistent. There is a sense that, you know, they have certain values and so on. And when we try to introduce uh, radical amendments on two lines, one line was to increase the direct democracy aspect in the constitution through a number of uh, methods, including referenda, but not only referenda, you know, trying to introduce ideas of direct organization in the workspace and so on. The second was to reestablish the social state after the financial crisis in Greece and the debt. I mean, the social state had been, had been uh, uh, you know, really uh, destroyed. So to create social and economic rights that would be justiciable. Because as we know, this is the thing about social economic rights, that as the liberals say, they're not justiciable, you cannot go to the court and ask for the right to work to be, uh, to be implemented. So we try to help that as well. Uh, institutional changes, democratic, uh, direct democratic methods, uh, socioeconomic changes by the improvement and uh, creation of specific avenues of redress for socioeconomic rights. Now, what we found, unfortunately, and I, I you know, I apologize to myself and to others, was that because they, these kinds of ideas, particularly the more radical, were not part of the normative expectations that the constitution creates in what I call the internal critique, they were not 
accepted. They were accepted, of course, by the last parliament because we had a majority. But because under the constitution, the amendment has to be approved by two parliaments, once we move to the current parliament, without any difficulty, the current parliament totally eliminated, rejected, and deleted all these changes. And there I uh, realized that as a critical lawyer, as someone who, you know, those, are, those changes we were introducing were not anything revolutionary or crazy. They were trying to help the poor people and trying to give power to the citizens uh, on the democratic side. If they are not put in a way in which once you are not in a revolutionary situation, we're not in a revolutionary situation, we're not rewriting the constitution from scratch, unless you try to play with the margins of the law, or the constitution in that case, you cannot succeed. That the law in its own internal logic and the normative expectations it creates for the public and for the opinion makers, the important people in this debates, uh, stop, you know, sort of, or, 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 you know, sort of really strongly, uh, strongly slows you down and stops you and so on. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, sort of is when I started feeling that, you know, the political aspect is important, but you have somehow to bring the politics into a kind of dialogue with the normative expectations, that you cannot surpass what the law is in a normal uh, political situation unless the political radicalism and the legal conservatism, to use a term, you know, are not put in a kind of dialogue that allows those limits to be, to a certain extent, uh, transgressed. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what I meant earlier with, uh, you know, the, the imminent is a political position, the imminent critique. And if it does not get into a conversation with the internal critique, with what the law allows you to do, uh, how much it allows you to go, then, of course, then you have a problem. And what is the problem? It is lack of effectiveness. You cannot achieve what you're trying to do. So it is, I mean, critical lawyers, we are in a, you know, it's a difficult position to be. It is not an easy position because you are both committed to the law and committed at the same time to change in parts of the law that clearly lead to unjust inequitable results. But it is an interesting position. It makes you really an, an interesting person. It opens you to other literatures, to other activities, to other people, to other practices. It is not just the lawyer's law. It is the lawyer's law with a strong sense of justice and a strong sense of interdisciplinarity. And this is, I think, what you certainly, uh, Maria Rosario, yeah, are teaching to the students, and this is wonderful stuff. So thank you very much. So we, we cannot see you. You are in the dark, in the darkness. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, I don't have a light. I'll put a light. Okay, so you really are in the darkness. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so thank, thank you very much again. Thank you, Christina, for being with us. So thank you all who uh, participate in this series. Uh, to, uh, thank you to the students for, for following, for participating and being here you are. Now you're just okay. your I would like to I, so, I you that. Are. So, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you thank all. You uh, I, I, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Christina perhaps to send me via Maria Rosaria your text, and I'll send you also texts about this, because I think there are very many uh, common themes there. Uh, but also I would say that perhaps uh, since you started this thing, uh, Maria, uh, you know, sort of at some point in the future, we could organize a panel with the two of us and perhaps one or two others so that we can have a, a, a better exchange, you know, sort of of views. I think it yeah. is very... It useful. would be great. It would be great. Yeah. 
and uh and uh, I'll, I'll send you um I will send you uh, in, I hope, in a few weeks, um, an article on law and architecture. Lovely, 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 lovely. Law, you send it to Law and Critique. And we would uh, love to see it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, okay, uh, so I have to go back, you know, sort of. To... Yeah, I'll go back to the election day. And uh, so have a nice afternoon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. At some point, please send me the uh, the recording if you have recorded. Yeah, sure. So I will send you the link. Okay. Right. Bye, so, bye. Bye. Thank you, thank you so. very much, and hopefully see you face to face, not too far. Okay. Off. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. 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 Ciao a tutti. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Arrivederci. Arrivederci a tutti. Ciao a tutti.